Coming up on five minutes after the hour here on the Wednesday edition of Helping Seniors of Brevard. Always good to hear that music and get our show underway. I'm John Harper, and here is the host of Helping Seniors of Brevard, none other than Carrie Fink. Hi, Carrie. Hey, John Harper. Thank you, and uh, welcome as you're uh, tuning in to WEJF 90.3 FM. It's always the fun time of the week, at least for us, and I hope it is for you, too, because we get together around the radio at lunchtime hour every Wednesday right here on 90.3 FM, WEJF. And uh, welcome to those listening online at wejf.net as well for the Helping Seniors Radio Show. And uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll sort of dive into all this. I want to introduce uh, Nancy Deerdorf, our operations director, who is uh, doing an amazing work of managing <laughs> telephones that are just going crazy with calls from uh, people that are, are looking for help. And uh, it's quite a job. How are you doing today? Good. I'm I'm very well, Carrie. Thank you. Good. And also, we have longtime friend of the Helping Seniors Network, and he's kind of like, I consider him a resident expert in here, but it's none other than board-certified elder law attorney, Bill Johnson. How are you, Bill? Good. Good afternoon, <laughs> Carrie. So many interesting things are going on right now. Uh, we were just talking before the radio show, and uh, we'll spend some time a little bit later on. Uh, about the car raffle and a couple of fun things that are going on uh, and getting ready to come up with that. Uh, Also, uh, look forward to seeing many of you actually tomorrow. uh, is Tomorrow's National Day of Prayer, and so another hat that I get to wear is have participated in that is actually the 10th annual uh, version of that. And uh, so the breakfast itself takes place at the Grand Manor, but it is sold out. So uh, this is the 10th year and 10th sellout and get a chance to speak a little bit about helping seniors uh, uh, right next to uh, none other than Congressman Bill Posey, who is uh, also going to be speaking tomorrow. So there's a lot of neat things that are going on in our county. One of the things that we want to talk about through uh, ever since Joe Steckler founded our organization, we're now in our 12th year of service. You know, we have really talked a lot about the importance of getting information in the hands of seniors. And Nancy, you are like on the front lines of that because you get the calls from people and they're asking you uh, or telling you exactly where they are and the kind of help they need. What are just, just kind of what is, is, I know last time we talked, affordable housing was topping that list by far, but what are you hearing these days? Yes, we get calls on our senior information line for just about everything from, uh, Issues related to household, legal, medical or health, uh, needing medical or health uh, resources. So you name it, we get it. Housing still tops the list, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sadly, in in some cases, uh, folks that are already homeless uh, by really no fault of their own. Um, so that still tops our list, but we get all sorts of calls. I always say there's no issue too big or too small. Uh, that we won't try to help help you lead you in the right direction. So even uh, some calls as simple as, I need a trusted handyman, mm-hmm. um, which is important. There's so many, and how do you know who to call? So right. people trust us that our network, we've vetted our network, we have trusted network of businesses that are senior friendly and trustworthy and do good work. Uh, so anything from a handyman to people need a resource for affordable housing, uh, you name it, it runs the gamut. Yeah. You know, since Joe set this whole thing in motion uh, after he retired from his work with the Brevard Alzheimer's Foundation where he got those Joe's Clubs built, you know, he set this senior information helpline because he, he, he was saying at the time, he said, you know, certainly memory issues affect a lot of seniors, but there's a lot more that seniors have to contend with than just just that. And so uh, I remember when I first met him, he was talking about getting an aging plan together. And at first I was like, what do you mean by that, Joe? What What is an aging plan? And uh, I finally started to get it uh, through this through this conversation that we're familiar with it because now they're telling us we're close to hurricane season. What's your hurricane plan? Well, we don't want a hurricane here. We hope that uh, we can be spared and it just stays out to the ocean and doesn't bother anybody would be my preference. But uh, we know that we have to contend with that. And so with aging, there are things that happen. And boy, it sure is good to be ahead of the curve rather than chasing to try to respond to something once it happens. And so as a 
sort of a theme for our year. We've been calling it getting your ducks in a row. So Bill Johnson, when we did, we did, if you'll go back and find the uh, issue that we did in March, 2022, it was all about elder law. Cause we, we were really wanting people to think about the kind of documents that people should have as we age, because otherwise, and Bill, I've heard you say this a million times, you know, uh, how nice it would have been to meet somebody 30 days before you met them because they came to you in response to a crisis, and now there's not really a simple way to help them. You have to go to very great lengths, very costly lengths, to make something work that could have been handled fairly simply early on. Correct. And, you know, an ounce of prevention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so uh, this month, I'm t- well, actually it's last month now, the April issue, we did the same thing with financial, all right? So we called it, let's get your ducks in a row about financial. And so we had uh, Beth Courtney, who had, who has been in the past a uh, board member of, of the Helping Seniors Organization, but has her own company called Financial Cornerstone Group. She wrote an article called Five Ideas You Can Use Now on Your Checklist. And we had some lots of other good uh tips in there you can get that if you missed any of those issues the good news is they are all available to you online uh and even if you don't have access to a computer i am sure uh, that if you give nancy a call she'll find a way to uh to 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 help you access this material one way or another we'll find a way won't we i mean if we have to print it out and mail it to them we'll do it but this is good information you got to have but those issues are archived both at the helping seniors website which is helping seniors of org, And actually senior scene also keeps their entire magazines online at senior scene Well, this month is may is older Americans month. So we made our whole issue about that and we have some just really good general articles. And so when I was emailing to, to bill and said, what do you think we should talk about on the radio today? He came up with a topic that was kind of out of left field. And I thought we've never actually talked about this before. And the topic is homestead. And Bill, when we go back to this thing about planning, getting your ducks in a row, making your aging plan, as Joe likes to call it, so often we, by our inaction, we actually cause a problem that we didn't realize we caused until later on down the road. That That's true, Kerry. And, <laughs> and, you know, we wanted to talk about Homestead and perhaps uh, a person's largest asset is usually their house. Absolutely. And maybe, Bill, a place to back up and talk about, because, you know, Barbara McIntyre, who she's a reverse mortgage expert, and she comes uh, regularly on the Helping Seniors radio show, and she's talking about if you're going to stay in your home, uh, there are things that you can do in your home that can be uh, that can help you uh, finance what you need to do to stay at home safely. But I think most of us, we hear the term homestead, Bill, and we understand something, we get some kind of a discount on our property taxes because there's a homestead exemption. But what does actually homestead mean? Homestead means it's the the building you're living in is your primary residence. Okay. So that that's the cornerstone of it. It has to be your primary residence. You cannot have more than one homestead. So you can't have a Florida house that's homesteaded and then a, another house in Michigan that you've homesteaded. And the states do talk, mm-hmm. and they will catch you. But um, <clears throat> so the biggest thing uh, most people think about when we talk about homestead is the 50000 you get off the assessed value of your house for property tax purposes. Uh-huh. And so everybody, when they, they think of homestead, they think about that. You have to go down, file with the property appraiser, bring a bunch of documents, mm-hmm. your driver's license, uh, title to the car, voter's registration amongst other things and prove that you actually live in the house and then um, they will give you that homestead and to deduct that off your property taxes nowadays the bigger thing is uh, that once it's your homestead it's also capped remember that save our homes amendment that went through so you're each year they can only raise your tax bill by three percent yeah. Okay. So it's capped. And so like in a market right now where inflation's five, if they didn't have that cap, your your tax bill would probably go up five, six, seven percent. Yeah. But if it's your homestead, it's capped at three. So year after year after year, that is a huge savings for homeowners. 
huge. So that's probably even more important than the the fifty thousand you get to deduct off the assessed value for property taxes. Uh, the other part of homestead, and there are three mm -hmm. different types of homestead in Florida. Really? Is probably uh, one that most people aren't familiar with. They might have heard a little bit about it, but uh, your house is exempt from creditors' claims. Wow. Meaning they can't come take your house. There are five exceptions uh -huh. to that. If you don't pay your property taxes, right. obviously they will issue a tax deed and eventually somebody will end up owning your house. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay your homeowner or condo association dues, oh. they, they can foreclose on your house. Wow. If you do not pay your mortgage, well, <laughs> obviously <sure. laughs> your, your house is the collateral for the mortgage. They can come and take your house. Right. If somebody works on your house and you don't pay them and they go through a process and perfect what we call a mechanics lien, they can foreclose on your house. Wow. And then the last one, which preempts everything, is if you don't pay your federal income taxes, they can foreclose on your house. So those are the five things. Why, why do I say all that real slow? <laughs> because... I am tired of hearing people tell me that the nursing home is going to come and take your house. Wow. Or that Medicaid is going to put a lien on your house. That is simply untrue in Florida. Our state constitution protects your house from creditors' claims. And even when you pass on. So if I passed on and I leave the house to my kids... Uh, the house is still protected from creditors' claims. Wow. So it is a pretty powerful uh, uh, constitutional you know, clause that uh, gives us that protection and been upheld in the courts time and time again. The, um, extent, when we leave it to somebody, that only applies to people who would qualify as an intestate heir of you. So that would be your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, uh, your parents, your siblings, mm -hmm. basically your family members. If it goes to any of them, it's protected from creditors' claims. Wow. So I had a guy uh, who was in a nursing home a few years ago, and in the will, he was a really nice guy. He left his house to his ex-wife, and if she, was, if she had died before him, it went to his kids. Well, he had a, a nursing home bill. He had Medicaid, mm -hmm. and we knew they were going to file a claim in the uh, in the probate. And since the house was going to an ex-wife, ah, she didn't qualify for the protection. So we simply had her disclaim her interest. So she refused to take her interest, and then the, it gets treated like she had died. And then the house passed to the kids. Well, the kids are protected. Right. So when it passes to the kids, the kids were protected by the homestead law. And then once the house was transferred to the kids, they turned around and did it back to mom. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, so they had to. But if you didn't know the proper order to do all that in, uh, they could have easily lost the house. Well, that's really the point of this whole discussion is we, we have talked so many times, Bill, Bill Johnson, elder law attorney, uh, we have talked so many times about this is why you don't run down to the hardware store and pick up a form and try to do this stuff on your, on your own because we just don't understand these nuances. And when you go to your office uh, or, or somebody that's really well qualified like, like you are on this, you know those things. We typically don't. Yeah, and I've heard from a whole bunch of uh, seniors out there, they, they've had a loved one die, mm -hmm. and in Florida, you're not liable for your spouse's debts unless you've agreed to be. So right? if, you, if like so-and-so, the wife has a car loan, but you're not signed on it. You're not liable for it. Wow. 
So what a lot of times what happens is one spouse dies, they have, uh, let's say, a bunch of credit card debt. The other spouse isn't a signer on the card, isn't, you know, uh, doesn't have that card, doesn't use that card. So technically the surviving spouse has no liability for that debt. Well, the collection agencies will start calling the surviving spouse. <laughs> And one of the threats they use is, if you don't pay this, we're going to come and take your home. Can't do it. Yeah, it's a flat-out lie. Wow. Uh, even if she owed the debt, they still couldn't do it. Wow. So, wow. But, yeah, anybody calls you up, say, you don't pay this, we're going to take your house. Uh, and it's not one of those five categories I mentioned. Uh, they can't touch your house. Nancy, th to me, th a lot of this is like new information I didn't know. Did you, did you know about some of these protections? I did not know about the credit card thing. Um, the only reason I know uh, just a, a, a micron uh, about it is what I went through with my sister sure. and my brother-in-law. Uh, I was the person that should have visited the attorney 30 days uh -huh. earlier. I understand. Uh, actually, actually in, in all honesty, I, I, I hit it uh, just on time because okay. – um, uh, I kind of guided them towards the, uh, an attorney uh, and getting a will and a trust, <clears throat> excuse me, power of attorney, the, right. the, the whole nine yards. And it really was just in time. It should have been done long ago, particularly with the assets that they had. But I do have a question for you, Bill, mm -hmm. um, regarding Homestead. So <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I've got a little, a little tickle in my throat today it's from talking on the phone so much <laughs> I, I um, know. <laughs> so my question is if you have uh, what we call uh, snowbirds if we have a couple that uh well i'll just use my sister and brother-in-law uh when they were alive they were snowbirds mm -hmm. and it used to be they would come to florida for like three months uh so their primary home was in cape cod massachusetts but eventually uh as they retired uh and, and got older and got more sick of the cold, they spent more and more time down here. And so it became sort of even, six months and six months. Uh, so in the case like that with people residing in two different states, uh, what would be the process a person they go through to decide which home to homestead? Like how would they find out financially what would be their best bet how did they research that and find that out to see if maybe they wanted to switch their homestead from uh, another state to Florida? Correct. And you can do that. You can uh, declare somewhere else as your homestead. Now, remember when I said you go to the property appraiser's office? Yes. That's because you have to bring uh, with you the, you know, your driver's license, your voter's ID card, all these things that prove you're a Florida resident. So if you were going to, say, switch from your homestead from a Florida house to, you know, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, you would have to go then and get a Massachusetts driver's license, Massachusetts voter's ID, and probably pay taxes in Massachusetts. Right, right. Right. So but, it, but any it is much more advantageous usually for anybody to move to Florida because yes. we don't have income taxes and... Uh, and we don't have a, an estate tax or an inheritance tax. Right. So beyond that, there's a lot of reasons why people should use Florida as their primary residence. Yes, yeah. Well, that's what I'd always heard is that is that Florida makes sense to have it as your uh, homestead, uh, particularly not only for some of the tax things that you were just speaking to, but I, but for sure, I remember what you were opening the show with when you were explaining about that cap. Uh, because we bought a home uh, in 98 here, uh, and uh, I know how our property taxes are for that house. Uh, over a period of time, we have another home that we rent out, and that's actually part of why the housing crisis, I think, is the housing crisis in Brevard, is because as the property values have gone up, so are the property taxes on that property. And then even if you're trying to be a compassionate landlord, you're still having to look at that to try to say, well, I've got to pay this, so I've got to recoup it somehow out of the house. And that's what's happening to a lot of our seniors, I think, is is the, the situation you're finding yourself in, Nancy, right? Because somebody new has now acquired the house. They're trying to make sure that they can cover whatever they invested in the house, all the operating expense of the house. The property taxes go up because it's not covered by that kind of kind of protection, that cap. 
And so, though, because I can just look at these, these are two houses, roughly the same value in the same neighborhood. And one bill is a few hundred dollars and the other is thousands and thousands. So it, there also are a lot of other tax exemptions that you can get. Uh-huh. Um, if you're a widow or a widower, there's that exemption. I think it gives you $500 off your taxes. Wow. If you're a, of a certain age, you can spread your tax burden where you don't pay the full tax bill. Huh. You, you only pay part of it. And then upon your death, when the house sold, they recoup the tax monies out of the sale of the house. Did not know that either. No, I didn't and, know that either. And then also, if you are you know, a 100% disabled veteran, you don't pay any property taxes right. at all. Um, and then there, there's a, a whole bunch of other ones I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's quite a few exemptions that people, you know, if you look at them, they, uh, they're all meant to try and keep you in the house and not make that tax bill a huge burden if you're elderly, disabled, things like right. that. Well, I know when we get into the second half of the show, I really want to want to. It's wonderful having you're such like a fountain of knowledge about this stuff. But I really want to when we get into the second half of the show, I want to talk a little bit more about how you guide people about their decisions about how you structure properties because I know one of the things we've talked about is Medicaid planning and and making boo boos there can be like hundreds of thousands. Even if they can't take your house, there's still other things that come up with that. So we've got a lot more to go on this conversation about homestead exemption. Before we get there, though, I wanted to, before we go to the break, somebody's hearing this and say, wow, I got a question for Bill. How do they reach you? Uh, they can call the office at 321-253-1667. Yeah, we're talking with Bill Johnson, board certified elder law attorney, and your law firm is uh, William A. Johnson, PA and your website, I think, is floridaelderlaw.net. Am I saying that Correct. right? Correct. And that is a great resource because you've got a lot of these tools and tips and things that people might want to investigate. Florida Elder Law Net is worth a visit. So when we come back on the other side of the uh, half half show break, we're going to dig deeper into this thing about homestead, Medicaid planning, and we're going to talk a little about the Helping Seniors Car Raffle because that's fun and we need your help. We can't do what we do as Helping Seniors without that. So we'll be back in just a moment on Helping Seniors Radio. And you're listening to 90.3 FM as we continue with the Wednesday edition of Helping Seniors of Rivard. 12.33 in the afternoon is our time. Let's get back to more of the program. And here is our host, Carrie Fink. Hey, Carrie. Hey, John Harper. Thank you. And thank you again, uh, listener, for joining us on 90.3 FM, WEJF, or if you're listening online, WEJF.net. And uh, also, hello to those of you that are catching this as a podcast later on, because uh, Helping Seniors since the start of this year has made all of these things, all of these radio shows, we made, we've made them available for years, by the way, on the Helping Seniors of Brevard dot org website on our youtube channel on our facebook watch page but uh starting at the beginning of this year we decided to go the podcast route also so if you uh like podcasts and maybe you use itunes or maybe you use uh hey alexa play me helping seniors radio or however you want to get there uh you can do that now with the helping seniors and so in the studio today we have two of our favorite people in the whole world it's uh it's really uh the the work that she does to keep the uh, wheels turning at uh, Helping Seniors of Brevard, uh, our 501c3 charity, Nancy Deerdorf, Operations Director, <coughs> registered nurse of, of 33 years' experience where you've you've served in that capacity. And then you also serve running one of the area's uh, most well-respected and largest home health service agencies, and you're kind enough now <laughs> to pick up the mantle and help help Joe and, and help all that we're trying to accomplish in Helping Seniors. Welcome back. Well, thank you. You 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 humble me, but honestly, it's it's my blessing uh, to be able to be such a part of such a wonderful organization as Helping Seniors of Brevard. Absolutely, and welcoming back to another longtime <laughs> great friend of the Helping Seniors Network. Uh, you you go back with Joe before there was Helping Seniors. It's Bill Johnson, board certified elder law attorney. Me and Joe go back to the dinosaurs. Yep. <laughs> no, it's so true. And we were just talking about during the break, you know, our theme this year is helping you get your ducks in a row, which is 
the fun way of talking about what Joe has always talked about ever since I've known him, that we've got to get our aging plan. We've got to get things put together in a way that will help us if we run into situations that we hope we don't run into. But, you know, if we do, we've at least addressed them up front or tried to. <coughs> and one of the things that I thought was fascinating about this, uh, Nancy, you've always had this expression, how do you know what you don't know? And I was just thinking through the first half of the show, just a couple of things that Bill just popped out weren't even in the it, directly in the whole thing about homestead. Right, yeah. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. And and like we were talking about during the break, you wouldn't even know to ask the question. Yes, exactly. When you know when people say I don't know something, but they know what they don't know. Right. That's a good thing. Right. You might not know what, but you know what you don't know about. Therefore, you're in a position to ask questions. Right. But if you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Then you don't even know what to ask to pose a question to someone like Bill Johnson to be to, to get that answer, which right. is why programs like this, why reading, why going to seminars, uh, the more you educate, knowledge is power. Uh, and uh, I really encourage seniors, all of us should be on, on continuously learning through yes. life, Con- continuously. It's what keeps our brains healthy and uh, learn and, and then you'll learn things and then maybe something that you learn will lead you to a question yeah. that will help you now or later. Yeah, I'm I'm almost smiling, thinking to myself, well, maybe our theme for the next year, once we get through Get Your Ducks in a Row, needs to be don't go this on your own. Because that's the other lesson I keep learning is like, we think, you know, most of us, we think we're fairly smart. Some of us are nimble on the computer, so we can go Google stuff and say, oh, I know what to do about that. But the the other lesson that I keep learning, particularly when I'm talking with Bill, is like, you know, there's differences state to state. In fact, isn't that one of the big debates that's going on in the news right now? Is this a federal issue or is this a state issue? And particularly when it comes to property and things like that, that has a lot to do with state. So like you choose, Bill, which state, you know, you choose to live in. But if you don't do all the paperwork the right way, you may not be getting all the benefits that you're entitled to. And that's what we're talking about with this topic of homestead today. Correct. The states regulate all the real estate located within their borders. Yeah. 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 And so if you make a choice and you say, well, I lived in, I'm just making this up. I lived in Illinois all my working years and, uh, you know, I've had a a home down in Florida for all these years and I kind of feel like I'm spending more time in Florida than I am in, 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 you know, up north because I don't like the cold winters or whatever. But if you're not tapping into some of these things that we're talking about with Homestead, you may be leaving thousands of dollars on the table. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. If you, and especially if you don't know the things out there. Yeah. You know, like the cap. <laughs> well, well <laughs> yeah. And then, and then we talked about this in the first half of the show. And if you missed any of that, the great news, like we talked about, is we archive these. So you can go back. Or maybe there's something that you heard. And you say, I want my mom to hear that. She needs to hear this. That's the great thing about having this library of resources is you can go back, pull it up, send them the link. They can get the the same benefit of the wisdom that we're all getting right now. But on Homestead, Bill, the other thing that you have you have uh, talked about over the years is not only is it beneficial for some of the reasons that we talked about, like your home is generally protected from creditors except in those five instances that you mentioned, but I've also heard us talk a lot about people do things that they think they're doing the right thing, but it's costing the downstream thousands of dollars. I'm, I'm talking in particular in this case about when you get to Medicaid and look back period. Somebody says, well, you know, I'm probably going to need Medicaid help. So I'm just going to give the house to my kid because they're going to inherit it anyway. And so they just do that. And now they've created a huge problem. Or even if they just add the kid's name to the deed and the kid did not supply any of the funds used to purchase the property. Really? That's a transfer for Medicaid purposes. So the house is exempt for Medicaid purposes. Uh, They do not count it as an asset towards your asset limits, which are currently uh, $2,000 for an individual and for a spouse, uh, what they call a community spouse, spouse at home, it's $132,400. And the house doesn't count. So there's no reason to do anything with the house or transfer it or anything because Medicaid does have a five-year look-back period. And if you transfer it, you're going to create a huge disqualification period. Yeah, and, and They basically take the value of the house, divide it by 10000 and that's the number of months you're ineligible 
for getting any benefits from Medicaid. So let's just use an example. Say the house is a $300,000 house. So if, if I'm saying this right, and, and I just gave it to my kids because I thought I'm going to end up having to get some Medicaid help anyway. So I just gave away, and you said 10000 a month, so for 30 months? Yep. You... I've got to pay the bill myself? Correct. So if wow. you don't qualify for Medicaid, they don't come and take your assets or anything. It's You're just on your own to pay the bill. And with nursing homes running 10000 plus a month. You'd be broke before you got yeah, there. You just, you know, $30,000. Uh, uh, you would pay 300000 in 30 months. You know the cost of your house, so. but the but the point of this, though, that looking at it the right way, is if somebody sits down with you or somebody that's well qualified in how to look at this, and you set this up the right way, you said it's not counted as an asset, so that you could still do what you had in mind, right? I want to leave it to my yeah. Kids. There are ways you can leave it by your will. You could do something called the ladybird deed that when you die, it automatically transfers to your heirs. Uh, you could put it in a trust. When you die, it'll go to your heirs. And and none of that involves putting anybody's name on the, the, the uh, title to the property immediately. Right, because it isn't, it's related to that, right, is the fact that if you, if you are hoping to do that and accomplish that, it's going to stay outside of the Medicaid, so you can still do that, but then you still set yourself up so you're not going to be hurt when you need that help, right? It's right. not going to have that waiting period. Right. And, but it's not just for Medicaid, right? Didn't this apply now to VA stuff too? It does. Uh, it does apply for VA. So the house is an exempt asset for VA. So they only penalize you to the extent that the assets you moved put you over, like if you're over their asset limit, mm -hmm. to the extent that the assets you moved that were over the asset limit. Mm -hmm. Then they divide it by about 2,500, and that's uh -huh. the number of months you're ineligible. Now, uh -huh. the, the tricky thing is the house does not put you over the asset limit because they don't count the house. So you could take the house and just gift it to your kids under VA rules <laughs> because wow. it's not an asset that put you over the limit. So it doesn't create anything that would create a disqualification period. So it, it's much better, under the VA rules, it's much better to transfer the house to your kids, let them sell it and turn it into cash uh -huh. than it is for you to sell your own house and turn it into cash, which of course counts to the asset limits. So see, Nancy, this is the point. Like, how do you even know where to begin? Like you're trying to, you know, this is why you shouldn't go, I, to me, it seems like this is why you don't go online and just call and, up something. Of course, it gets trickier because you may move the house to your kids to get VA. And then, of course, you may end up in the nursing home needing Medicaid. Wow. Now that transfer to your kids that got you on VA is a huge problem to get Medicaid. Wow. So you right. really have to look out what you're doing in that. So you go to these places online and do your own will. and you. Can, you I just, get calls about that. You could be I get, doing yourself in. <laughs> I, get, I get calls about it, and I beg them not to. I beg them to seek an attorney, yeah. uh, an elder care attorney. Um, I have... I have been able to per persuade people to take numbers, yeah. uh, such as uh, Bill Johnson. And whether or not they called you or not, Bill, I don't know. But <laughs> um, I've been lucky enough to persuade them. And yeah. I, I use my own experience to help them, to say, look, you go to an elder care attorney. You may not like uh, the price up front. You might go, oh, wow. But what my sister uh, paid for her trust and will, and uh, there was a gamut of other yeah. things, was a drop in the bucket compared to what she would have lost or not been entitled to or what was saved because she went through an elder care attorney. See, what, what you're saying is so important because I look at it this way. So if you really want to think about it, Bill would make more money from this person if they showed up with bad planning, right? Because they're going to need right. all this extra stuff that they never had to do. So these people say, oh, it's just a trick. He, they're just trying to get money. I can do this cheap online. No, that's no. not the case. Bill would, you know, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's funny because in a weird way, how many times do you have to step into a case where somebody brought you documents that don't work and now it's like way more than what it should have cost? Very frequently. 
Yeah. And so, so this is the point why we keep talking about what Joe has originally said. You got to do your aging plan. You got to get ahead of this. So back to the homestead question. There's so many nuances here, right? Yep. And we're going to talk about one more. Let's go. <laughs> okay. So when you have a house, uh, Imagine my house is in my name only, Mm -hmm. and then I meet this wonderful woman, and I get married, Uh okay? And we, she has her own house, I have my house, we move into my house, Uh, we have a handshake, the handshake is that when I die, all my assets are going to go to my kids, when Mm -hmm. she dies, her assets go to her kids. Okay. So, I die, Mm -hmm. and even though the house is in my name... That's not what happens. Wow. Because the Florida Constitution steps in and gives the surviving spouse what we call a life estate Uh in the homestead property. Okay. And it doesn't matter if she's got her own homestead. It's my homestead, Ah. and I'm married, so my spouse gets the life estate, and this is automatic. And then the remainder, meaning when she dies or the life estate's extinguished, it goes to my kids. Okay. Now, under the statute, you can convert that life estate interest into a one-half ownership interest. So even though I was going to leave all my house to my kids, my kids could end up owning half the house with her. Wow. Totally unintended. So uh, the only way to get around that is uh, to either waive the homestead, we call it devise and dissent in the deed, or you can actually do a a pre- or post-nuptial agreement Mm -hmm. um, uh, waiving that right. Wow, you see. (laughs) Now it gets worse. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Now, that also applies to me doing anything with my house. If it's my house and I wanted to sell it and it's in my name and I'm married, my spouse has to sign that deed, even though they're not on the the title. And if I want to mortgage my house, I have to have my spouse's permission to mortgage my house. I've had a couple cases where it's got really interesting. (laughs) Uh, It happened to involve a couple gentlemen who were gamblers. Uh Uh-oh. And they got themselves in Uh some gambling trouble. There were two different cases. But one of the things they had done was try to get a mortgage on the house without their wives knowing about it. And in both cases, and I don't know how this happens, but in both cases, they forged their wife's signature on the paperwork. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, The spouses had never consented, and they actually forged the spouse's uh, signature on the paperwork Um, and did get the money and, of course, blew it, uh, as you can imagine that gamblers frequently do. Wow. But yeah, so I can't transfer the house. I can't. I can't mortgage the house without my spouse's consent, wow. and I can't even. You know, there are restrictions on how I can give it away, unless, of course, we have a pre or a post nuptial agreement uh, waiving that right. So that's one that always catches people in second marriages. They're not thinking about that. They get married again, and next thing you've given your spouse. Uh, certain rights in your homestead. Wow. You also have given uh, a new spouse something, the right to what's called the elective share, which is 30% of your estate. But that is not automatic. They actually have to make that election by filing paperwork at the courthouse. <laughs> but well, yes, getting married does have consequences. So <laughs> so what, what, what about people who just shack up? How does that work? <laughs> well, just... they have no rights under Florida law because we do not have common law marriage mm-hmm. in Florida. So they are not treated as anything. Yeah, because uh, Nancy, I know I've heard you get some calls where somebody, they're not married, but they're in the same house. And now one person has to leave the house. They passed away or they now have to go to long-term care. Or yes. some, you know, And then the other person is just flat out on the street. Uh, correct. Yeah. I've had I have a couple of uh, I'll, I'll say phone calls regarding yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of them hasn't happened yet. Right. Uh, but it's a case of uh, two people uh, that have lived together for forty years. 
Wow. Uh, not married. Uh-huh. Um, uh, one of them has a child from a different mm-hmm. relationship, an right. adult child, in fact. And um, if the homeowner passes away, uh, the the roommate, if you will, uh, will have no place to live because the home uh, will end up going to the daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a little bit of an estrangement there. Oh. So this person literally will have no place to live. Uh, now the good news is, we, you know, I'm I'm working with this right, person right, right, for right. future plans, and it's it's not even a matter of I can uh, help this person get into housing right now because this person doesn't right. want to change the situation. They right. want to continue to. Of course, uh, if you're comfortable live together, there. Yeah. yes, and share expenses um, that way. But yeah, it's it's something to think I, about for sure. Yeah, I've had it even get worse than that, where <laughs> they've lived together for 40 years, and then one of them ends up in the hospital, and then the kids show up and bar the other significant other from even getting into the hospital yes. to see them. Oh, dear Lord. Yes, and, yes. And that happens quite a bit. And that's just another reason you need to have all your documents in a row. And, you know, especially if you're in a, a, a live-in relationship like that, and you put 40 years in, you you probably want to make sure that the person's will says, hey, the house goes to my friend. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what yeah. I was going to ask you, Bill. So even in those cases, they should be seeking your counsel or somebody that's right. the, uh, that, that understands and all And then they meals. should have the power of attorney, the health care surrogate, yeah. you know, with their significant other's name on sure. it. Sure. Otherwise, they can be totally locked out of the end of life. I wow. really should be a salesman for your practice, Bill, because <laughs> um, that's exactly what I say to people. I'm yeah. like, you need the, you, you probably want the whole gamut, uh-huh. but uh, you know, I can't give advice. I just, right. the only advice I give is call and explore and ask questions. Uh, but I, I'm, you know, when people ask me, I'm like, you, you probably need the whole gamut. Uh, and people, uh, Carrie, to your point that you've made a lot, uh, you don't need to be extremely wealthy to have a trust. No, no. And so I tell people my experience. I tell them I can't tell you what to do, but I highly encourage you call this number, call this elder care attorney, and uh, it, 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 they will lead you. Uh, Bill will lead you in the direction of all, what you need. I, I highly recommend all of it, the whole package, the deluxe package, mm-hmm. Bill. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you know, I, I've said this so many times along the way. It's like, you know, because, because going back to Nancy, what you say, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And, and you know, people like to make, oh, you can just check three little boxes and your form is done online and stuff like that. But you could be – the problem is you make these mistakes today – and you won't know for five years that it was a fatal error, you know, is, is, is how I look at it. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of some of these people I find they didn't they did they ended up not getting married because there was some financial reason. Right. Like they would have lost their military benefits if right. they had remarried, or they uh would have lost uh, you know, uh social security benefits. There's usually some you know, background reason why they didn't get married because they didn't want to lose out on uh, certain benefits that you know their prior spouse had 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 wow and so this is why again you can't do this on your own so we've been talking with elder law attorney board certified elder law attorney bill johnson uh, of the law office of william a johnson FloridaElderLaw.net is your uh, website. You've got some great resources there, but if somebody does want to reach the office directly, what's the number that they can? It is 321-253-1667. And I really hope that as you've been listening to what we've been talking about, that you get a sense that, you know, the problem is each one of our situations is going to be nuanced and different. So it's not like you can just go, well, I'll just do what Fred did. <laughs> it's right, not that exactly. simple, yeah. right? You've got you've got to find a way to to take the time to explore that and find out. And Nancy, to your point, like you said, you know, the education I keep getting is like when they start using words like trust, which I always think is for millionaires, billionaires. No, it's it's probably for us because we own homes. I mean, you know, it's just it's incredible that what we don't know. And so, as you know, that's the mission of helping seniors at Brevard is to help you know what you don't know. And as Joe says, to put together that aging plan, we call it getting your ducks in a row. And how do we do that? We can only exist with your help. Uh, we're a Florida 501 C3, C3 charity, which means we're just a, it's a fancy term for nonprofit, which means that 
we exist to serve you. No other reason. Nobody, this isn't anybody trying to get rich. We're just literally trying to keep the organization going so we can do the service. We've helped 4,500 families free of charge uh, since Joe founded this organization. And Nancy, you've, you've explained you get upwards of 300 calls a month. Yes. Uh, which is just showing. And, and, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, although we have a lot of rocket scientists here in the Space Coast, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand how fast this area is growing. The number of people that are, are saying, I want to be in Florida for whatever reason, the population is growing. And these people, they're coming in. Maybe they did good planning up north, or maybe they had some documents done, or maybe they never bothered with it. But it is a different landscape here. Because- Florida is not the Florida of yesteryear. No. It just is not. Uh, there was an article that came out a couple of weeks ago in CBS News mm-hmm. that talked about it's one of the least affordable states now. Yes. Uh, it's not where uh, what people used to think, where the, the there's no state tax. That's still true. But um, state income tax. But uh the the part about like cheap housing it just doesn't exist not yeah. and and even even more expensive housing there's two problems lack of affordable housing and lack of housing period right so even even if you can afford a lot just lack of places to live yeah it's def- uh, definitely yeah. the uh, the the seller's market but you know one of the things as you were talking about that I keep I keep hearing over and over is this is why the work of helping seniors is so important as you get those calls and you're helping people move their way through all these questions, uh, we got to have your support and help to keep what we do going. So a fun way we do that is the Helping Seniors Car Raffle. This is now our sixth year. This is the fun part of what we get to do. We get to go out and play with uh, AJ Hires. He's the he's the guy behind Boniface Hires Motors. We get to play with his new cars. <laughs> it's yes. always fun. He, you know, he's got a Chevy dealership. He's got a Dodge dealership. He's got a Kia dealership, and he's got a Mazda dealership. And so years ago, because him and Joe go way back, he said, you know, AJ says to Joe, I want to help you guys do this as a fundraiser. I'll make a car available from each one of my dealerships and you can just pick the car the winner can pick the car that they want and so uh now for the sixth year we're coming back october 29th is the grand uh drawing uh mark pylock the uh guy who has his personal collection called the american muscle car museum like 70 80 90 million dollars worth of cars under one roof unbelievable it's amazing it's an amazing amazing. take in even if you're not that into cars yeah you will be when you go there (laughs) yeah so you got to get your helping seniors car raffle ticket because we we've got just got a minute so i've got to give you the phone number 321-473-7770 or helping seniors car raffle.com you'll get all the information about the helping seniors car raffle put october saturday the 29th on your calendar because your ticket gets you in there in addition to being a donation maybe you win a car you get to have fun at the museum so bill johnson elder law attorney thank you for joining us today florida elderlaw.net nancy deardorff as always thanks for being here and being part of helping seniors and we will see you next week right here for helping seniors radio on 90.3 fm wejf